Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm John Feinblatt, president of Every Town for Gun Safety. Founder of Moms Demand Action, a grassroots arm of Every Town. Today, we're hosting Senator Tammy Baldwin for the 11th installment of Demanding Women, Quarantine Conversations About Gun Violence. Senator Baldwin, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me, and thank you for all you do. Uh, thank you for those kind words. Now, as you know, we've been talking with women leaders about urgent issues like social justice, police violence, and COVID-19, all through the lens of gun violence. And as a senator, these are issues you have to confront just about every day. But when it comes to gun safety, you have a unique perspective because you're a gun owner. And like the overwhelming majority of gun owners, you support common sense gun laws. Of course, your commitment to gun safety is particularly valuable because you're a lawmaker from a key battleground state. You supported a bill to expand federal background checks. You're a champion of gun violence research, and you earned an F rating from the NRA, which I have to tell you in my book is a badge of honor. We're eager to hear your thoughts on why an issue with so much popular support still runs up against political opposition. So Shannon, why don't you take it from here? I'll hop on Twitter and watch the rest from there. Thanks, John. And thank you so much, Senator, for being here. We're so grateful for your time. And we'll just dive right in. Um, earlier today, Congressman John Lewis, who was an inspiration to millions, was laid to rest. In a New York Times op-ed published just this morning, he wrote, you filled me with hope about the next chapter of the great American story when you used your power to make a difference in our society. What do you think we can learn from Congressman Lewis in the fight for a more just nation? And how do you think we can apply those lessons to gun safety? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I, it, it, it was um, so uh, sad to have the uh, passing of, of John Lewis, who I had the honor of serving with in the House of Representatives. Um, I joined him on one of his pilgrimages to Selma. Um, but the last time I spent a significant amount of time with him was actually when he was causing some good trouble in the House, as he liked to say. Um, uh, after the failure of the House to take up uh, important, critical gun safety uh, legislation, uh, there was a sit-in uh, that he helped uh, organize and supported uh, a number of newly elected, uh, particularly women members of the House of Representatives who uh, uh, felt that uh, their voices weren't being heard. And this was a way to, uh, to make their voices heard. And I uh, walked over from the Senate side of the Capitol and uh, participated in that sit-in, that good trouble. Um, but I think that's the sort of leadership and example that uh, John Lewis set. He believed, and he said that in uh, the op-ed that he wrote that was published today as he's laid to rest, um, that uh, it's about ordinary people um, committing themselves to making the world a better place, uh, working to achieve equity, uh, standing up, speaking up, and speaking out, and never, ever quitting. And uh, that's what we have to do. Um, but I think he's such an example of how we can all play a role in creating a more peaceful and equitable country. Uh, that's that's uh, the inspiration I will always hold dear from John Lewis. I agree. Uh, President Obama just said in his eulogy that we all need to be more like John. And I, I think that's exactly right. Senator, as, as John mentioned in the introduction, um, you're a gun owner. You hail from the Midwest. You know that responsible gun ownership goes hand in hand with common sense gun safety laws. So what should we be doing to ensure that gun owners and hunters and Republicans know that this movement is about gun safety? It's not an effort to take away their guns. Well, part of it is what we just talked about in following John Lewis's inspiration. 
that we have to be the educators, that we have to be the one to one to speak truth to power. Um, what you see every time we have uh, a, an effort at the state legislative or federal level to pass common sense gun safety legislation, we have a very powerful organization, the NRA, that um, uh, strikes fear and uh, and ex uh, expounds myths, truths about what the goals are and what uh, legislation would do. Uh, take, for example, universal background checks. That should be the law of the land, and it would uh, it would help increase safety dramatically. It might not stop uh, all of the gun violence that we see, but it would go a long, long way uh, in advancing the cause. And I know from hearing from constituents in my state that responsible gun owners and non-gun owners alike think it is just common sense to have universal background checks. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it's going to have to ultimately be our voices elevated uh, to drown out that of uh, the NRA. And I should also note that um, while I don't believe the, the NRA uh, even speaks for all of its members, um, it is a very powerful and very well-funded organization. And, uh, and yet, uh, we're a democracy of and by and for the people. And our voices should count uh, much more because there's more of us. I, you know, there's, there have been polls that suggest 98% of the public support universal background checks. Yeah, that's why it's so important people vote on this issue. Um, Senator, you've called the lack of action on gun safety in Congress a moral fa failure. And some of your colleagues have failed to address the newer public health crisis of coronavirus. So what can we learn and fix when it comes to addressing these old and new public health crises that are, are both ravaging American communities? Um, well, it, it, it's, I think... Uh, a great analogy to compare the failure of leadership in the face of this pandemic and uh, and the lack of moral leadership on uh, gun safety. Um, you know, right now uh, in the pandemic, we are seeing things get worse, not better. But we're seeing an administration that has uh, failed since the very beginning to take the necessary steps to flatten the curve. We could have saved so many lives. We could be in a very different place right now if the administration had acted quickly and not ignored the science and not ignore the evidence, um, but, uh, but followed it. The same is true with regard to gun violence. And yet we continue to see that situ situation get worse rather than better because of the failure to act and the failure to lead. Um, mm -hmm. as, as was said in the beginning, um, I'm also a very strong supporter of gun safety research, uh, gun violence research. Uh, a wide body of research could have uh, even improved our knowledge and um, helped bolster uh, the case that we make for these common sense safety reforms. Um, because we would have uh, more uh, study backing it up. Uh, as it stands now, we still have privately funded research that very much points in the direction that the whole set of reforms that we're talking about would save lives without threatening Second Amendment rights. And, and speaking about the coronavirus crisis, just the other day, Senate Republicans released their proposed COVID relief package. From your perspective, what was missing when it comes to addressing these crises that are gripping our nation right now? Well, I'd start with uh, some policies that are missing from there. And those were the ones I was just referencing with regard to what should have been done uh, back in January when we knew this was coming. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, Labor Department should have been uh, charged with help, helping to keep essential workers safe 
by articulating enforceable standards for our workplaces. Things like the wearing of masks, protective gowns and gloves for healthcare workers and workers and, uh, and uh, folks in uh, congregate living situations like nursing homes and assisted living. Um, and uh, as the economy, of course, uh, began to open up, uh, those enforceable standards for safety and health uh, needed to apply to more and more workplaces. The failure to do that has led to additional spread of the disease. Secondly, um, it was clear from the very outset that we had dire and critical shortages of the things that we need to fight the pandemic, things like masks, gloves, gowns, things like tests, testing platforms, swabs, other supplies related to testing, and other medical equipment. Uh, the president should have centralized that process and immediately uh, uh, started uh, incenting a uh, domestic manufacturer of all those things that today, at the end of July, we are still short of. And then um, the uh, the I, I think that the CARES Act, which was the act passed at, late in March, was still optimistic in terms of when this would be getting better. And so today we stand on the eve of uh, the unemployment insurance program uh, that uh, supplemented state uh, uh, benefits with a pandemic federal benefit. It expires tomorrow. And the uh, GOP plan uh, fell well short. Uh, I just list, uh, I mean, I could go on for a long time, but let me just list <laughs> a couple other critical areas. Um, there is no assistance uh, to state and local governments who have really been put on the front line of this in part because of the failure of the federal government to take some of the actions that they should have taken, the, the Trump administration. And so at a time when they're on the front lines of providing essential services to their citizens, they are lacking revenue because of the pandemic and they are needing to make cuts in um, at a time when uh, that's the you know very very ill advised and uh, lastly the failure to expand uh, Medicaid so that the five million Americans who've lost their health care uh, can have some uh, some health protections uh, during a pandemic again it, it's such a, a a failure it falls so short of meeting. Uh, the needs of individuals, families, communities, and uh, you know, and and our states. And, and Senator, meanwhile, the House is moving its strongest ever gun safety appropriations package, which would include a fifty million um, dollar uh, injection for gun violence research. And so, this package will also address the surge in gun sales that we've seen during the coronavirus pandemic. What would it mean for gun violence prevention if the Senate took this over the finish line? Oh, it would be uh, just a, a crucial step. And, and I will add to the House's credit, uh, very early last year, they uh, also passed a very comprehensive set of policies uh, uh, in order to uh, help uh, uh, deal with uh, the a gun violence epidemic as the public health crisis that it is. Um, but I was pleased to see uh, their leadership in the appropriations uh, measures uh, advance this week. And, uh, you know, it's just the sort of difference we need to make right now. Thank you, Senator. We're going to go now to a, a video question from the Director of the Office of Violence Prevention at the City of Milwaukee's Department of Health, Reggie Moore. Good afternoon, Senator Baldwin. As you know, I work on local issues related to community safety and violence prevention. Last year, I had the honor of presenting on a congressional panel on community-based solutions to gun violence prevention. In 2017, Milwaukee developed and launched its own community-based violence prevention plan known as the Blueprint for Peace. The current movement across the country is calling for more comprehensive approaches to public safety. What is your stance on increasing local and national resources for violence prevention? Oh, I think it's absolutely essential that we do that. And, um, you know, one of the things that we haven't really uh, talked about 
uh, yet is um, just the disproportionate impact of both the coronavirus pandemic, but also uh, gun violence on communities of color. And uh, the um, uh, city, uh, uh, sorry, the county of Milwaukee, uh, I might add, uh, was one of the first communities to name racism as a public health crisis, which was a, a very important uh, step in uh, laying bare uh, the the inequities and the systemic racism and how it impacts people's health, well-being, et cetera. Uh, the recent uh, uh, Black Lives Matter protests after the murder of uh, George Floyd um, have also uh, prompted a really, I think, additional discussion, Reggie, that, uh, again, Milwaukee was forward in, in doing this in 2017, but sort of thinking about what public safety means and what roles need to be handled by law enforcement, but what roles might be better handled in a health model, uh, whether we're talking about uh, certain um, uh, serious mental illnesses or we're talking about uh, drug and alcohol addiction. Uh, right now, we have a criminal model for dealing with those issues, but it might be uh, much wiser to look at those as public health issues uh, and uh, and and put people who have the background and training of dealing with these complex issues at the front lines. Um, and, and so those dialogues, I think, are critical in creating safer communities uh, and, and working more closely together. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Reggie, for that important question. And, and you were just talking about um, the horrific death of George Floyd, uh, killing of George Floyd. And I know you support mm -hmm. the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, and yeah. your Senate colleagues on the other side of the aisle have proposed a much weaker bill. What would you like Senator McConnell and Republicans to understand about police violence? Well, first of all, uh, I, we've talked a number of times about how science and data uh, are, are really important to inform public policy. And uh, as, as we were all taking part in the crafting of uh, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act uh, led in the Senate uh, by Cory Booker and Kamala Harris. One of the first things Cory said to all of us is, we lack the data. There is uh, legislation that encourages the voluntary collection of that data at the national level. Under this administration, there has not been much of a, an effort to collect it. But I think if people know how rampant it is, uh, that um, the you know the the uh, issue would get uh, additional support. I think also uh, in addition to collecting that data, um, it would certainly show where there are uh, departments that um, you know are are uh, perhaps repeatedly disciplining uh, certain officers. Um, and yet they are not uh, ultimately discharged, or if they are or leave, they can easily get hired in another jurisdiction because uh, that data is not shared and is not transparent. Um, so that's one really important piece of it is sort of the research piece of it. Another, of course, in that policing act was what I was just talking about with how do we create safer communities, grants to allow local communities to look at different types of public health interventions and healthcare models for treating serious mental illness um, or, uh, and I should say, uh, substance abuse disorders. Um, instead of simply criminalizing it and dealing it with it uh, in a model that doesn't, um, doesn't tend to uh, be very effective. Um, so there's, there's so many things um, in the Justice and Policing Act. Um, but in terms, uh, additionally, of uh, being able to track every use of force a case and, and identify whether the victim of that use of force was, um, uh, you know, what, what was their race or ethnicity, uh, but also uh, to see, uh, you know, can we be effective in banning chokeholds? Can we be effective in ending 
these no knock um, uh, entries like the one that resulted in the death of Breonna Taylor in her own home. Uh, because if we don't keep track of these things when they're used, uh, uh, we're not going to be able to marshal the evidence that we need uh, in order to uh, make the difference that we need to make. Senator, I'd like to pivot now to 2020. I know we are all look, we were looking forward to gathering in Milwaukee for the convention. Yes. Um, instead, we will ga gather virtually. But how do you think President Biden should be talking about gun safety leading up to Election Day? You know, I, I think that um, uh, in part, uh, I might suggest that he start the same way you did, which is reflecting on the passing of John Lewis and uh, and urging and inspiring people to speak up speak out, stand up, demand change. Um, and uh, and I think that, um, I, you know, there's no question that he is on the side of the people here. And also <laughs> that he recognizes the undue power of uh, organizations like the NRA. Um, but we do need... Um, uh, we do need to uh, have new leadership in this country. And I think uh, Joe Biden, who is coming to Milwaukee to give his acceptance speech at the convention, even though most of it will be virtual, um, is the leader we need at this time and on this issue. Uh, Senator, we have a question for you from social media. Uh, a supporter on Instagram wants to know, what piece of advice would you give to women um, to encourage them to run for office? Oh my. Well, I um I know in my own case uh that uh I started uh by I started pretty young at life, I might <laughs> add, in, in uh political activity, but I started by volunteering on other people's campaigns, um, demystifying the process. I used to uh this is before um, I had cable TV and could watch them on television. I used to sit in on city council meetings and county board meetings. And I remember this moment um, where I said, I'm as smart as anyone in that room. I could do this <laughs> job. It's, and, and that was both learning the skills related to campaigning and how you run, but also uh, uh, sort of seeing what decisions get made at different levels. And um, that was really, really helpful to me uh, to make a fairly uh, early decision in my, uh, in my adulthood to run, to dive in, to do it. Um, I had done uh, some organizing with various uh, political advocacy groups uh, after college, uh, fighting for equal pay for equal work, uh, fighting for, uh, you know, all sorts of local issues. And that also exposed me to others who were very involved and became my network when I first uh, decided to run for office because we had all worked together in common cause. So those are among the things that I would suggest. So join um, Moms Demand Action, uh, <laughs> yeah. join Every Town. Those can be very much among the... Uh, 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 the things that uh, we can do. And, and Senator, you know, your election um, in 2012 really made history. You became the first Wisconsin woman elected to the U.S. Senate and the first openly gay member of the Senate. Um, I have a gay daughter named Emma, and she happily does not know a world in which marriage equality isn't a fact of life. Um, but she does know a world in which hate crimes are disproportionately faced by queer people. And all too often that hate in America is armed with a gun. So can you talk a little bit about what more we need to do to protect uh, the LGBTQ American community? Yes. Um, you know, first of all, uh, I think that um, I've seen dramatic changes. I've seen positive changes. But um, it certainly, uh, you know, marriage equality and uh, the recent Supreme Court case banning job discrimination um, has not ended um, all discrimination or hatred, as we know. 
Um, I do think that uh, the, the visibility of the LGBTQ community um, is one of the things that changes hearts and minds and ultimately laws. Um, but I also think that it's important to uh, recognize that hate crimes um, are intended both to victimize the individual target of that hate crime, but also create terror in a whole community who shares characteristics. So whether it's a uh, hate crime based on race, uh, creed, uh, ethnicity, uh, LGBTQ status, um, they are, are, uh, they are uh, horrendous in their uh, impact, uh, immediate impact and, and broad impact. Um, we do see too many of these terroristic uh, uh, events happen with uh, guns. Um, you know, I, one can uh, think back to Orlando and uh, heartbroken uh, as um, we saw one of the worst uh, mass killings uh, in our nation's history. And uh, that was clearly targeting both uh, base, on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, and um, ethnicity. And uh, uh, there's, um, there's no room for uh, that. And uh, again, common sense gun safety, mem uh, uh, gun safety measures would make a big difference. Senator, very last question. Uh, I'd like to close with a message from you to Moms Demand Action and Students Demand Action volunteers who have been fighting tirelessly for gun safety and winning. Um, what is your message to them? Well, uh, you inspire me is part of my message. Um, uh, you know, when I see youth activism, when I see Moms Demand Action, um, you're tenacious. Um, you are committed to not only organizing, but educating. And it is only when we do that um, first as individuals, then in greater numbers and greater numbers um, that we make the change that we need to see. Um, but yes, continue to stand up, speak up and speak out. We will. Thank you so much for joining us today, Senator. We are incredibly Thank grateful you. for your voice in this fight and that you're in our corner. Thank you. Thanks also to everyone who joined us today on Twitter and Facebook. Stay tuned for our 12th and final episode in the Demanding Women series tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern with Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. If you'd like to join us in this fight, get involved with Every Town, Moms Demand Action, and Students Demand Action by texting the word READY to 64433. And as always, stay safe and remember, nothing is more productive persuasive or powerful than demanding women.